morning, good morning. Welcome to Rock Lake Baptist Church. Uh, we're glad that you're here today. It's uh, a little slick out there and uh, obviously some of us didn't make it. So we're glad that you're here. We need you. Uh, announcements, uh, pastor's gonna take care of most of that. Uh, chicken foot at the Waddell home at uh, 5.30. So you're welcome, bring a dish to pass. And uh, also I may mention, uh, thank you for cards and uh, prayers and so forth for Millie. Uh, we appreciate that. And uh, you're welcome to stop by and uh, visit for a half hour or so. She's certainly up for that. So uh, we'll be looking for you. And uh, Jim said he couldn't come today because it's snowing. I told him, well, he's already here. He might as well stop by. <laughs> so uh, if you're here, uh, stop by. Uh, that'll work. We'll make it work. So other than that, uh, praise the Lord. We're glad that you're here today. And uh, we look forward to a great day in the Lord. Pastor. And ladies, don't forget the Moms and Tots on Tuesday at 10 in the morning. And they meet here and are doing a book study together. And you're welcome to come even if you haven't been to one yet. You'll still uh, appreciate and enjoy it. We do have a business meeting tonight after the evening service. So uh, plan to be here for that. And uh, men's breakfast is this Saturday at 8 o'clock here at the church. Um, we're going to be talking about building discernment. And uh, we're going to have breakfast. A couple of men are, are volunteering to get things ready for us and all that kind of stuff. We're going to suggest that you bring $3 uh, to help cover the cost for that. Of course, visitors are free. And uh, all of our college students got snowed in. <laughs> Maranatha sent out a text this morning and said, stay here, because they hadn't been able to get their own uh, parking lots cleared. So uh, they told all the students to stay on campus. So they, but we'll be having a, uh, a fellowship with them after uh, church next week. All right, I think that's all of our announcements uh, for this morning. Let me turn it over to Brian to start our song service. Uh, praise to our Savior. Let's stand and sing uh, page two. Come Christians, join to sing. singing this morning by turning to page 51. Hallelujah, hallelujah.
Jeremiah 33 says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah the second time while he was yet shut up in the court of the prison, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the maker thereof, the Lord that formed it to establish it, the Lord is his name. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. I have a good missionary friend who quotes that verse quite often, and he says, God loves to surprise us, to give us things that we don't anticipate. I want to uh, remind you to pray for our missionary families of the week, Mike Fiocchi in Albania and Neil Forrester in New Mexico. We have their letters posted out there on the board in the back. You can read those, see what's going on with both of those. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you that we can gather together to worship you. And to have fellowship with one another. I thank you for each person that is here this morning. I pray that you would bless our time together, Lord. Help us to be an encouragement and edification to one another, as your word tells us to be. Help us to lift one another up in prayer throughout the week as we ought. We think of our friends who are not able to be here this morning. We think of Millie as she continues to recover from surgery. We pray that you would give her renewed strength and quickly that she would even be able to bounce back sooner than the doctors have anticipated. Pray that you would give her healing in her body. I pray to your God for Pastor Lincoln as well, as he is home and still recovering, and we just pray that you would continue to strengthen him. We think of our other elderly folks that are not able to be with us today because of the weather. I think of Emma Stewart. I think of the McGraws and the Wolleens, and I thank you that uh, they are uh, faithful members of our church and love to be here when they can. And I just pray that you would help them to have a wonderful time in your word today. We pray now, Lord, that you would meet with us. Show us yourself in a new way. Help us to learn what we need to learn today about ourselves and about you. And I pray, dear God, that you would help us to have the fellowship that we should enjoy together as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we missed the choir today because of our foul weather. Uh, we sure appreciate our uh, song leader, Josh Howard, and his family. And uh, though they're not able to be here today and our choir, but we're grateful we can have each one here sing this morning. So we're going to stand uh, this morning, page 239, in Christ alone. Let's stand as we sing. Yeah. 
and our final song this morning will be page 87, He is Lord. the ushers to come forward at this time please and we'll take this morning's offering these funds are used for the the needs of this ministry here and we send out money from this offering as well to the missionaries around the world the missionaries we prayed for this morning this is the time for us to give our tithes and offerings lord we thank you so much for the opportunity to give back to you we thank you for trusting us with these worldly goods we pray now, Lord, that you would help us to be good stewards of that which you have entrusted us with. And as we try to help our missionaries, Lord, that we would be able to help them with generosity and bounty. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you uh, to several of you who have stepped up to take responsibilities that you don't always do because of people not being able to be here today. I appreciate that so much, and uh, it helps make the church what it is, a body of Christ with each member ministering to one another as every joint supplieth, the Word of God says. Turn with me, if you would please, this morning to John chapter 21. John chapter 21. I apologize. I didn't look up exactly which page it is in your Bible in the Pew Bible, but I think it's about 100 or 101, something like that. John chapter 21, and we're going to read the beginning of this passage together this morning. You can remain seated as we read this morning because this is going to be a rather lengthy reading. John chapter 21. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and on this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter, 
and Thomas called Didymus, and Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and had cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were two hundred cubits, dragging the net with fishes. As soon then as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon, and bread. Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land, full of great fishes, an hundred and fifty and three. And for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them, and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. We're going to stop there with our reading for right now. I want you to remember the scene here and what the situation was. Just jumping into the passage of Scripture right here in chapter 21, you have to realize there's 20 chapters before this. And there's been a lot of things that have led up to this point. And we talked on Easter Sunday about the resurrection of our Lord and how he showed himself to the disciples and how he showed himself to Mary Magdalene, how he showed himself to the uh, to Peter and he showed himself to the disciples in the room where they were all shut up for fear of the Jews. And now John says this is the third time that he showed himself to the disciples as a group. The second time he showed himself to the disciples as a group, it was kind of for the sake of Thomas, because he said, I don't believe because he wasn't there the first time. And Jesus said, you don't believe? Put your finger in the prints of the nails. And uh, Thomas was rebuked for his lack of belief. But this is now the third time. And there's a special reason why Jesus comes to this. And we didn't read it yet. We'll get to it in a minute. But it's interesting. I want to uh, turn on the slides this morning and show you a couple of things to get the right setting here. Uh, for you. Try that again. There we go. All right. Is it going to work? Keep going. Keep going. All right. Um, where is the Sea of Tiberias? Do you know where that is? It comes by several other names. Okay. It's also called the Sea of Galilee which is probably the one that we're most familiar with. It's also called the, the Sea of uh, Chinnereth or Lake Gennesaret. All those are different names because there were different languages being used at that time. Uh, Chinnereth is a, is a word that describes a harp, which is the shape of the lake. It looks like a harp. Um, the uh, Gennesaret and Tiberias and Galilee are all different words to describe the same place. Um, I'm not sure which button to push here. There we go. How about that? There we go. There was a reason that Jesus came out here, as I said before, and it was because there was a failure and something needed to be fixed. On the night when Christ was arrested, do you remember what happened? Do you remember what the disciples did? They fled. They deserted him. And I can imagine that they all had a bit of a sense of guilt. And then Peter, who was kind of the leader, kind of the spokesman, most of the time in the Gospels when it talks about the disciples and who was there, it lists Peter first and then everybody else. Because Peter was the one who was always sticking his foot in his mouth. He was always the one who stepped out first. He, was, he just had that kind of personality. And now... 
they have returned to the Sea of Tiberias. And this is what I want to show you. When Jesus was crucified on the cross, it was down, let's see if I can see it so I can point it out to you. Right here, Jerusalem is, is where Jesus was crucified, where he was buried, where he rose again. And that's where the disciples were when Jesus showed himself to them the first couple of times. But now they have left Jerusalem and have traveled back up to Galilee, which is where they are from. Peter, James, and John, Peter's brother, all of them were from that area. And when they were first called to be disciples of Christ, they were out fishing because they were fishermen. Peter evidently owned several fishing boats. And these guys were part of his crew. And they were in business together as fishermen. And when Jesus called them to follow him, they left their nets and followed him. But now they go back. And Peter says, I go a-fishing. And the other people said, I will go with you. It's interesting because this is actually a fulfillment of a prophecy that the angel said to the women at the tomb. Let me read it to you. Matthew 28, verse 5, And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. This was a trip. My wife and I had the opportunity to be there a couple of years ago. And we drove down from the Sea of Galilee along the River Jordan down to the Dead Sea and then back to Jerusalem. And it took us a full day. So this was quite a trip for them in those days because they weren't riding in motor coach buses as we were. Um, they had to travel by foot or on a camel or a donkey or a horse or something like that. So it took them some time to get back up there, probably several days. So they had taken a trip, and when they got up there, they were not anticipating seeing Jesus again. There, we can conjecture, we can surmise, we can guess as to why they went back to their previous work. I think it's because Jesus was no longer there leading them. He was no longer bringing in offerings, which is how basically they supported themselves. They needed to work for a living. So they went back to Galilee, and they needed to support their families, and they went back to work. And what they did for employment was they were fishermen. So they went out, and they had a bad night fishing. Many of us that enjoy fishing have had those disappointing times. You go out all morning, get up early in the morning, get the bait, go to all the hot spots, and nothing happens. And they had fished all night and caught nothing. Seven disciples, including, the, including Peter. It was a frustrating night fishing. They were trying to meet their family's needs. They were trying to perhaps to keep their minds busy. Verse 4, but when the morning now was come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. It was early morning. It was probably still dark. It was just beginning to dawn. It was hard to see who it was talking to them from the shoreline, and they didn't recognize his voice. We saw earlier on the road to Emmaus, the two disciples did not recognize Jesus when he was walking with them face to face. Mary Magdalene did not recognize Jesus when he was standing there in the garden. Evidently, the resurrected body of Christ had a different appearance. It didn't look exactly the same as it did before death. Don't know exactly what the difference is, but there was something different about him. And they didn't recognize him. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. This is the question that you like to hear when you got a big one in the live well, and you don't like to hear when you haven't caught anything. So how you doing? What you catching? You got, any, you got anything yet? They say, nope, nothing's biting today. They said, no, we haven't caught anything. But here's, here's what I often say. Why did Jesus ask the question? Did Jesus really not know how they had done? Of course he knew that they hadn't caught any fish. Jesus asked the question so they would realize their situation. 
They had no food. It was a fruitless endeavor. They had a need that was not met. And he wanted them to realize their situation. So then he said unto them, cast the net on the right side of the ship and you shall find. And now they couldn't draw it. They couldn't pull the net back into the boat because there were so many fish in it. They couldn't get back up over the side of the boat. They had to leave it in the water and drag it toward the shore. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loves saith unto Peter, this is John. He says, Peter, it's the Lord. This is the same thing you did last time, remember? We fished all night, we didn't catch anything. And he said, put the net on the other side and we caught. He said, it's the Lord. Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord. He girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked and did cast himself into the sea. Now, we understand he wasn't stark naked, okay? But he'd taken off his coat because they were working, they were fishing. And he throws on his coat and jumps in the water. Now, I've got a simple question to ask you. When is the last time you went swimming and you put your coat on first? Okay, this goes to Peter's state of mind, okay? Peter had denied Christ. He had now seen Christ three times. The scripture says, and we're not told anything of the account, but the scripture says that he had appeared unto Simon before he showed up to all the disciples. So Peter had already seen Jesus face to face one on one. Plus he'd seen him twice with all the disciples. He knew that Jesus was alive, was no longer dead, but he still doesn't have quite peace and he's not thinking straight. You don't put a coat on before you go swimming. But that's exactly what he did. He grabs his coat, throws it on, and he jumps in the water. Now, he jumped in the water one other time he got out of the boat on the Sea of Galilee. You remember that? Jesus came walking in the midst of the storm across the water. And Peter said, if it's really you, Jesus asked me to come out. So Jesus did. So he stepped out of the boat then, too. But that time, when he started to sink, he prayed the shortest prayer that I've seen in Scripture. He said, Lord, save me. Because <laughs> he was starting to sink. It wasn't because he didn't know how to swim. It was because the, the, the waves were so bad, he thought he was going to drown. Well, this time he's like, I'm gonna, i am gonna, got to get there. And so he jumps out of the boat and he swims to shore. And he was about 100 yards away. For me, that's kind of a long swim. Peter, evidently, that wasn't that big a deal, especially with a coat on. I don't know. He swam 100 yards and got himself to shore so that he could see Christ first. And I think it just goes to show that he was still a little bit unsettled in his mind with all the guilt because of what he had done to Christ on that night the other disciples came in a little ship for they were not far from land 200 cubits that's 100 yards dragging the net as soon as they were come to the land they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid there on and bread now wait a second they just got there with the fish how did jesus already have fish on the fire he probably created them on the spot fish and bread i don't know maybe he didn't maybe he went and bought some somewhere i don't know but he already had it going. He had the fire going. He had the food there ready. We're going to come back to that in a little bit. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes. That word great fishes means like what we would say. These were big fish. Okay. These were good catching fish. Great fishes. 153. For all there were so many yet was not the net broken. What does that mean? What does it mean that they caught 153 fish, big fish? That means cha-ching, okay? Payday. They were fishermen. They sold these fish for a living. Now they got 153 big fish in one catch. This is awesome. This is Jesus being good to Peter and to the disciples. He's being gracious. We're going to see that again. He provided. He gave large fish and he gave a lot of them. Verse 15. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas. Simon, son of Jonas. He hasn't used that term since he first called Peter. When they first met he said, Simon, son of Jonas. Now he calls him that again. Simon, son of Jonas. The point is that Jesus hasn't changed. Yes, Jesus died on the cross. He was risen from the dead, but he was the same person. 
And he spoke to Peter in the same manner as he did before. Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? Now there's a little bite to this question. What does he mean more than these? It's one of two things. Either he was talking about the fishing, the boats, the fish, the net, or what I believe is that he was talking about the other disciples. Do you love me more than these? They had just eaten together. They were sitting around. And Jesus says, Peter, do you love me more than these? And the reason I say there's a little bite to that, because Peter had boasted before Gethsemane, before the arrest of Jesus. Peter had said in Matthew 26, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. In essence, Peter said, even if everybody else turns their back on you, Jesus, I won't. And Peter sa- Jesus says to Peter, do you love me more than these? And he saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And you've probably heard this before. The words that they use for love there are a little bit different. Jesus says, Peter, do you love me with agape love? That's a self-sacrificing love. That's the highest form of love. That's the commitment love that God has toward us as sinners. And he says, do you love me with a committed love? And Jesus says, Lord, you know that I love you like a brother loves. They were words that they often used at the same time, but they were different words. Peter didn't say, I love you with the commitment love. He says, I love you with the brotherly love. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me with that commitment love? He saith unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love you as a brother. He saith unto him, feed my sheep. The point is this, Peter was not willing to boast again. Before he had said he was was willing to do what nobody else would do. And now he is very careful not to overstate his own capacities. He saith unto him the third time, verse 14, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me with phileo love? Do you love me with brotherly love? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee with a brotherly love. Why did it grieve Peter? I think it grieved Peter for two reasons. Number one, because he changed the word to phileo. That Jesus said, do you even love me with the love that you say? This brotherly love. And I think the other reason was because it was the third time. I mean, that would bother all of us, but especially Peter. Because how many times did he deny Christ? Three times. And now Jesus asks him this question three times. And Peter is grieved in his heart. And he says, Jesus, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said unto him, feed my sheep. Jesus also commissions him publicly here to shepherd his flock. Lead and feed them. Take care of them. That's what it means when it says, feed my flock, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. He's, 1 Peter 5.2. Peter himself is writing to other preachers. And this is what he says. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof not by constraint but willingly, not for filthy lucre but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So Peter understood what Jesus was teaching him and telling him and instructing him to do. Feed the flock. Feed my sheep. They're God's sheep. The people who come to know Christ, who attend a church just like you're doing this morning. 
You're, you don't belong to the pastor. You belong to the Savior. He's the shepherd. And the pastor stands up as an under-shepherd, contract laborer. My job is to shepherd you as his sheep. And that's what Peter was called to do. Jesus evidently stopped right here, took some time after this conversation. Because in verse 20, it says John was following. So as we come to this next verse, I believe there's been a slight transition. I think the restoration is over. The other point I want to make about that restoration is that it was public. It was right there in front of the other guys. Now, why would Jesus do it that way? Why wouldn't he just do it one-on-one? -on -one? Because Peter's sin was public. People knew about it. Even people outside their group of disciples, the little maid, the Gentiles, they all knew that Jesus had denied Christ. And so it was done publicly as a restoration because the sin was done publicly. But now, verse 15, excuse me. <coughs> verily, verily, I say unto, you, unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. That almost sounds like a riddle to us. But Jesus was explaining something to Peter. He was explaining to Peter what was going to happen as Peter served Jesus. It even tells us in the next verse, This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. Jesus told Peter how he was going to die. Peter was crucified. And he insisted that he be crucified upside down because he didn't, want, he didn't feel like he was worthy to die the same way Jesus died. And here, Jesus tells him, Peter, when you die, it's not going to be in a sickbed. You're going to die serving me. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, follow me. That was the instruction. Peter, it's time to step up. You said that you would stay with me through thick or thin. You said that you would stand with me when nobody else would. And you failed. But you understand now that you love me. And I'm commissioning you to feed my sheep. And you've got to be committed to follow me. To do what I tell you to do. And that's what Jesus was telling him. Then Peter, typical Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following. That's John. Which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Okay, God, Jesus, you've explained to me what I'm going to be doing. What's he going to do? That's just typical Peter. He's the same person he was before. Sticking his nose in where it doesn't belong. And Jesus saith unto him, verse 22, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Peter, that's none of your business. Don't worry about it. Do what I have instructed you to do. So Jesus gives him this instruction. In the next couple of verses there, explained to us, this went, then went this saying abroad among the brethren that that disciple John should not die, but yet Jesus said not unto him, he shall not die, but if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? In other words, he wasn't telling Peter, John's not going to die. He was saying, Peter, that's none of your business. Don't worry about it. What is that to thee? And then John identifies himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. This is the disciple which testifieth of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. That's not just an exaggeration. The Gospel of Luke says that Jesus 
spent much time in the temple day after day. He would go sleep on the Mount of Olives and the people would follow him to the Mount of Olives and he would teach them there. And then the next morning they would be rising up early in the morning meeting him at the temple again. And so he was constantly pouring himself out for three and a half years. And each of the four Gospels is an account of Jesus from the perspective of a different person. And they don't always tell every single one of the same stories that all the other ones do. John is perhaps the most different because he kind of picked and chose different things to tell. But John says, if we tried to write down everything he did, we couldn't even do it. So I want us to recap here. I want us to see again Peter. I want us to consider his situation because here, here's the deal. Peter had failed miserably. Judas betrayed Christ and out of guilt went out and hung himself committed suicide. Peter had denied Christ. Almost the same sin. And he was guilty. And there was a problem. Because you can imagine if one of your friends has done something like this to you, wouldn't there be a problem between the two of you? There's a, there's a betrayal there. There's a broken trust. There's hurt. When that cock crew and Jesus turned and looked at Peter, Peter went out and wept bitterly because he knew what he had done to Jesus Christ. He understood what a failure he had just committed. What a terrible sin. And how he had hurt his Savior. But now we see Peter and how he handles this. And I want you to understand, Peter was trying to make ends meet the only way he knew how. He had six others with him. He probably had lost some influence. And he wasn't really the reason the twelve had stayed together anyway. It was Jesus that they had been following. Peter was frustrated in his endeavor, having caught no fish all night. He was excited that Christ had come to show himself again. He jumped in to swim to shore. He was confused. He put on his coat in order to go swimming. But he was humble. He was humble. No longer was Peter boasting and saying, if nobody else will be faithful to you, Jesus, I will be. Now he's humble. He's not boasting of love stronger than he had. He was embarrassed. No doubt, realizing it hurt, disappointed, and rejected Jesus when he really could have used a friend. Three times he denied Christ. And Jesus asked him to attest to his love three times. He was still seeking to please Jesus. He had not given up on loving him. He was still learning. Even as we saw, he still stuck his nose in somebody else's business. He still had lessons to learn about humility and service. But he was humble. He was humble. How do you fix a failure? If you're the one who has committed the failure, you need to be like Peter. You need to be humble. You need to be changed. You need to learn the lesson that you should learn. And Peter had eaten crow, so to speak. He realized that what he had done was wrong and he was not going to do it again. Jesus gave him the chance to boast again. Jesus said, Peter, do you love me with a commitment kind of love? More than all these others? And Peter didn't do it. He didn't boast. He said, Lord, you know that I love you like a brother. But he did not step beyond and boast. Then we need to consider Jesus in this same situation. And this is the exciting part. 
Because how do you restore someone who has failed you? In the word of God, we're instructed to restore those that are caught in a fault, in a sin. And as a church, we have a responsibility to restore them. How do we do that? Well, Jesus gives us the example. First of all, he initiated the contact to restore Peter. He said, I'm going to go before you into Galilee. And when Peter got there and started doing what he was doing, Jesus was there. He initiated the contact. He called out from the shoreline, hey, you got any meat? Jesus initiated the contact. He also had prepared to welcome him and the rest of the disciples. He had a fire going and food there when they got to shore. He didn't start getting ready once they showed up. He had set the table. He had prepared for this restoration. He had not changed how he approached them. Similar circumstances as the first time he had contact with them out there fishing all night, no fish. He gives them a great catch. He called Simon, son of Jonas, as he did when he first called Peter. Even the miracle, a great catch, was the same. Jesus had not changed how he dealt with Peter and how he dealt with these disciples. And he was not stingy with the ones that had run and hid when he was captured. But he was generous, and he provided food for them. He gave them a great catch, and he gave them a meal. He was very gracious. Jesus, in doing this restoration, was full of grace. Large fish, lots of fish, prepared fire, prepared food. He was kind in his questions. He was thorough in his questions. He was public in the restoration. All the disciples that were there heard him say, feed my sheep. In other words, Peter, you are fit for service again. I want you to serve me. I'm telling you to serve me. And the other disciples heard it and they realized that Jesus not only had forgiven Peter, but was restoring him to service. Feed my sheep, feed my lambs. And he was instructive in his commission. He told Peter, you're going to do this and this is what it's going to be like. This is how you're going to die. And you're going to glorify God through it. He was instructive. He was detailed. He was public. He was kind. So what can we learn? Well, from Peter, we can learn humility. And from Jesus, we can learn grace. Which side of the story are we on? That's what determines which one we need to focus on. If I'm the one who's messed up, then I need to have humility. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And that's what we're seeing right here is God giving grace to the humble. When you and I mess up and we get in a predicament and we need God's help, how do we get that help? Is it by saying, hey God, I'm so good, treat me right? Or is it by saying, God, be merciful to me, I'm a sinner. I know I don't deserve it, but will you please help me? Humility, that's the key. And Peter was humble. And then from Jesus, we learn grace. From the story, we learn that God is the God of second chances. God didn't have to allow Peter to do anything after this. Go ahead, go back and fish, Peter. That's not what Jesus did. God is the God of second chances. He forgives sin. You and I are wrong when we refuse to forgive. Jesus told a whole parable about it. About a man who came before the king and he owed the king this huge debt. And the king forgave him. And then he walked out of that courtroom. And the next person he bumped into was somebody that owed him about the equivalent of about 20 bucks. And he said, if you don't pay me right now, I'm going to throw you into prison. 
And the point that, God, that Jesus was making is that we have to forgive other people. And Jesus gives us the ultimate example. And here he forgives Peter. We have to forgive. Then he restores to fellowship. When somebody blows it, when they hurt us as Peter hurt Christ, when they reject us, when they refuse to be our friend, when they should be our friend, when they refuse to back us up or to support us as they promised they would, Peter said, I will even if nobody else does. And he didn't. That's called a letdown. And Jesus not only forgives him, he restores him to fellowship and he restores him to service. He treats him the same way he did before the betrayal, before the denying. He treats him the same way he did when Peter was saying, I love you, I love you, I love you more than everybody else, I love you. Jesus treats him the same way. He doesn't treat him like a second-class citizen. He restores him to service. He commissions him to feed my sheep. God uses broken vessels. He fixes them. And he enables them to serve. Isn't it a good thing that God uses broken vessels? We're all messed up. And we all need him. He honors humility in his servants. God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. He honors humility. And he has a task for the humble servant. Do you realize that if you are a child of God, that you have a purpose for being here? You have a task to accomplish for God. There's a reason why when you accepted Christ as your Savior, he did not immediately take you home. Because he has a job for you to do. And Jesus had a purpose for Peter. A task. He said, follow me. So, each of us today is in one of two situations. Either we're the person that has messed up and every single one of us has been there. Sometime or another. At least in our relationship with God. Even if you've always had a perfect relationship with your parents and with your brothers and sisters and with your children and with your grandparents and with your aunts and uncles and with your kids at school and with the co-workers. Even if you've never messed up with any of them, anybody never messed up with any of them? We all have, haven't we? We've all been in that side of the equation. But then sometimes we're on the other side. Sometimes it's when somebody else has done something wrong to us. We need to be instructed from this situation and realize how did Jesus restore Peter? He was gracious. He was kind. He was generous. And he put him right back in fellowship. He didn't treat him differently than he had before. Now, Peter was humble. If Peter had not been humble, Jesus would not have treated him in this way. God resists the proud. And we all know from experience, and we've seen it in other people too, those times when we mess up and we don't admit it, we're not willing to confess our sin, we're not willing to say, I was wrong, and it's my fault, but instead we're like Adam and Eve, oh, it's, it's her, it's him, it's the serpent, somebody else made me do it, I was tricked into it, it's their fault, it's their fault, it's his fault, it's her fault. As long as we have that attitude of pride saying it's not my fault, God resists us. But here, Peter doesn't have that attitude. Peter has the attitude of humility. So if I'm dealing with a person who has that attitude of humility, I need to treat them as Jesus treated Peter. With kindness, with grace, with forgiveness, with restoration to fellowship. When I forgive somebody who has betrayed me, who has hurt me, I'm to treat them just as much as a friend as I did before. Now, we can go back to specific situations, and I will say this one thing. It does not necessarily mean that you trust them, 
as you did before, but you treat them with the same kindness and you fellowship with them in the same way as you did before because that's what Jesus did. And he gave them a task to do. Jesus had a purpose for Peter. Now, you may not have that role with the person that hurt you. You may not be their boss or their authority. But you can love them and you can treat them and give them the same kind of friendship and fellowship that you did before if you have chosen to forgive them because they are hum humble. And if they are, if they are coming before you contrite and saying, I messed up and I did what was wrong, will you please forgive me? Then you, if you're going to be like Jesus, need to forgive. And you, if you're going to please God, need to forgive. No matter how bad the hurt was. Even if you're not over the hurt yet. Jesus, in the midst of being crucified, said, Father, forgive them. That's forgiveness. Be gracious, willing to forgive and restore to fellowship. Initiate the contact and prepare to be generous. If I'm willing to be at a loss, that's what it is to be generous, is that you're giving of yourself. You're losing something. Am I willing to lose something to restore that person to fellowship? Then I become like Christ. Let's pray together. Lord, we've all been on both sides of this. Every single person here has been hurt. And every single person here has hurt somebody else. Peter really made a fool of himself. He really made promises that he could not keep. He boasted, he was proud. He said, even if nobody else is offended because of you, Jesus, I won't be. And yet when he was standing there watching you on trial, he said, I don't know him. And he did it three times. And you would have been just to close the door on Peter to let him go his way and to work through the other disciples. But you chose to restore him because of your great love. You treated him with grace because he was humble. And you gave him the opportunity to demonstrate that humility. And you did it in front of the other disciples so that they would understand Peter's remorse and the change that had happened in him. And you did it before the other disciples so they could see that you were loving him and that you were going to restore him to fellowship and you were going to give him a job to do. And dear God, we need to have that wisdom, that grace, that generosity of spirit to initiate contact with those people that have hurt us and to be generous with them and to be kind and to be gracious and to give them the opportunity to express remorse. But many times our tendency, Lord, is to hang on to that hurt. We don't want to forgive. We want to hang on to that hurt and be mad about it and be angry and be frustrated and become bitter. Lord, help us not to be that kind of person. Help us to be like you. Help us to be willing to be walked on by others, to serve them, and to still come back to them with kindness and grace when they take advantage of us and when they hurt us. And Lord, if we are a person here today that has hurt you and we've all been there at some time or another, but if there is something we have done against you or something we have done against a person, I pray to God that you'd give us that spirit of humility. We must humble ourselves in order to be put back into the proper kind of fellowship. Help us to admit our wrong. Help us to confess our sin. Help us to reject it and to turn our back on it and to change our life course so that we can be in fellowship with you once again. In Jesus' name, amen. I give you the opportunity this morning to come forward and pray if you would like. Many times that helps to solidify a decision. You don't have to do that. You can pray in the pew. But let me encourage you, if the Holy Spirit has touched your heart about something that you need to humble yourself about, get that taken care of. 
Get your heart right with God. Get your heart right with other people. Express humility. Confess your sins. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And that's what he does for Peter. Let's stand, please, and we'll sing together. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Go ahead and lead us, please. fitting song. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word. We pray that you'd help us to make it a part of our lives, to base our lives upon it, Lord, to live our lives in accordance with your word, to use it as the blueprint, and to build our lives on the firm foundation of Jesus Christ. I pray, dear God, now that you would give us safety as we go home, and for those that are able to make it back tonight, Lord, I pray safety once again, and I pray that you would bless us as we seek to serve you. In Jesus' name, amen.